Hello, everyone, and good morning. I hope last night was wonderful. I saw a lot of you at the bar pretty late, but P.S., I hope you had a good time. This has been a wonderful conference, and the last day is always bittersweet because I, I and I hope you love joining this community in person. It's nice to connect with all the people you've seen on Zoom and all the people you haven't seen for a very long time. So again, hopefully we'll meet again in Orlando next year, same weekend, last weekend of June, and I hope to see you all once again. This morning, I have the great opportunity to introduce Buddy Cassidy. I'm not sure he needs an introduction, because I think those of us who watched the advisory committee meeting just a few weeks back knew Buddy Cassidy, and I kept thinking as he spoke, you go, Buddy, you tell him. And he did just that. He really, for all of us, won a day. So for now, I'd like to share with you my good friend, Buddy Cassidy. Excuse me a second while I, while I get my hands up. <laughs> um, before I start, I just wanted to give major props to Colin Worth yesterday, who totally beat me in the Hawaiian shirt game. Like, he really brought his game with that uh, blue Hawaiian shirt with the red armadillos, kicked my ass. <laughs> so, you win, Colin. Anyway, hope. Dum spiro, spero. As I hope, I breathe. And let this be the motto for our coat of arms, our family crest. Faith and hope have brought us here to this moment. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For a time, we waited in darkness, praying, hoping, and sometimes what we hoped for seemed impossible. And yet somehow, we believed in the impossible. We stopped calling it impossible and said, it has yet to be done. And this sustained us. We walked and sojourned and toiled in darkness and light, in faith, out of faith, questioning faith, but never abandoning it. Ever onward in faith that the better day we hoped for would come. Others, outsiders, doubted but they could not see what we saw. We possessed a piercing clarity of vision. In our collective faith, we found proof of things there in the process of becoming, but not yet seen. So it was, but now, at last, hope comes into focus, standing plainly before us. Indeed, there is more to do. I know we've come so far but we've got so far to go. But now, let us pause and bask in the glow of our achievement. Let us pause in gratitude. Let us pause in celebration. Let us watch as dawn rises and brings in the day. Friday, May 12th, 2023. I woke up, I got ready, uh, peered over my notes, I uh, got set up at my desk, and then suddenly I felt a bit dizzy, a bit of vertigo. I felt the weight of the task ahead of me. A battle raged for nine hours. At least that's what they tell me. I can't say I lost track of time. I could only think of how to bring the committee to see what I saw and what you involved in the clinical trials already knew. How could I bring my colleagues to see with new eyes and feel the weight of our needs, our hopes. Time stood still. The earth stopped turning. And then the earth shook. The ground trembled. Heaven's vault cracked. I felt it then. You felt it then. We all felt it. That sudden, lurching crash as the Duchenne landscape shifted. And so, because of things seen, miracles seen, boys with Duchenne maintaining strength, getting better. The FDA Public Advisory Committee 
recommended the approval of the first full-fledged, broadly applicable gene therapy for Duchenne. When it was finished, I sat there, still trying to accustom myself to what had just happened. Things would never be the same. The world, this world, was new. We, the Duchenne community, across the ages, brought it into existence. It is good to have hope, just hope, plain, unqualified. I do not question it. I do not bother trying to name it. I don't believe in false hope or frustrated hope. There is only hope. Thank you, Chris Furlong. Those are not my words. Those are Chris's words. But I'd like to just add to that, that when Pandora opened that box, everything escaped, but there was one exception. One thing left for humanity, hope. I find myself warned by hope, able to return to our fight, our struggle with renewed vigor. I will admit in recent years, I had doubts. I too have faced my dark night of the soul. Last year, I'll say last year was tough. A bunch of compression fractures, um, got a bit reclusive, uh, found my depression and anxiety creeping back. And I was angry, really angry. At 33 years old, I'm certainly not the only one left in my peer group, but it has dwindled significantly. Frankly, I began to dread waking up every day, fearing that I'd hear another one of my friends did it. I was just like, okay, this is enough now. This is getting to be too much. So I began to drift clumsily, aimlessly, until I got that email from the FDA. I didn't hesitate. I didn't think twice. I was ready to suit up. So I really cut back on my activism, my involvement in the DMD community in the past few years as I delved further into uh, my English PhD program. Um, I started teaching undergrads and began work uh, on my dissertation. So I thought I was, well, I thought I was retired and that I could uh, devote myself entirely to quiet scholarly pursuits. Um, but as they say, man plans and God laughs. Reality the real world broke through. Now, to say that I took my task, uh, with an, uh, my task with an open mind is something of an understatement. My understanding of the DMD research landscape was dated, current as of the Teplerson decision. I had been out of the game for quite a while. While the FDA patient rep program told patient reps when they, uh, they were looking for someone who had experience with a neuromuscular disease, I thought I knew exactly what was going on. No doubt it was another axon skipping therapy, another AON variant. And then when I received the sponsor briefing document before the meeting, and it's kind of like Monty Python, and now for something completely different. And that's exactly what I thought. I thought, oh. Wow, this is different. Something entirely different. Completely different mechanism, microdystrophin, the primary surrogate endpoint, and the therapeutic agent were one and the same. Um, my interest was piqued, so I just kept reading and reading because that's what I do. That's my job. I read things. And I won't say the 124 pages flew by, but you see, I just have this compulsion that once I start reading something, I don't stop until I'm finished. Um, and what I saw looked good, more than good. And then 
I moved on to look at all of the, the safety data and recorded adverse effects to perform the benefit risk assessment. As patient representative, my foremost task is to perform a benefit risk assessment analysis. My guiding questions are straightforward. What are the benefits? Are they clear and consistent? What are the safety risks and potential adverse effects? What level of risk is the community, community willing to tolerate? Given the potential benefits, are the potential risks worth it? And is there a significant chance that this drug could cause a new, a, a host of new and catastrophic health problems you wouldn't otherwise encounter in the natural course of DMD? So, in order to answer these questions, I'd have to look within to my own lived experience and without to the collective wisdom of the community. How did I do this? How could I identify the collective wisdom of the community and bring it to bear? By evaluating the health and needs of our community, taking its pulse, what does our heart say? This is why I follow nearly every Duchenne social media group out there. I am always monitoring the pulse of the DMD community and constantly reevaluating our needs in the face of new developments. Some expected, some not. Just in case, the readiness is all. I began doing back in this back in 2015 before another ADCOM, and I never really stopped. Again, just in case. When someone important needs to make a, a decision or issue a judgment, they must not go it alone. You must take counsel. I was confident in my judgment because I had good and reliable counselors. All of you. You spoke to me in the trial data, in white papers, in footnotes, in testimonies, in videos, in your social media posts. I kept silent as I took counsel so that I might hear you better. So I took the pulse of the DMD community, I examined promising trial data from Sarepta, and then I started reading the testimonies of clinicians in the docket. Accompanying some of the testimonies were before and after videos of dosed patients. I watched the videos and I watched them again and maybe one more time. Most wonderful. And then I called my mom into the room. Mom! 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 Bud, what? I'm doing something. No, Mom, you need to come here and see this. And so she did. And I watched her eyes well up with tears. And who couldn't be moved? There is nothing like a miracle to restore your faith, your hope. It was a miracle. And you know what's hard to quantify? Miracles. <laughs> but what would I say? What would the collective voice say? How could I render the voice to move heaven and earth in the direction we needed it to? How could I render, how could I convey to the committee what I knew to be true? More simply, how could I take all of the information I glean and make it say something. And not just say something, but in a persuasive way that could make things happen. So for days I examined, weighed, and sifted all I had encountered. I made myself a packet with key terms, observations, questions organized by topic, with relevant quotes, various appendices, detailing the studies and a list of key players and publications that shaped the conversation up to that point. You don't want to even know how many times I poked around and reorganized my little 12-page packet. 
Though the adcom lasted roughly nine hours, I didn't feel tired until the very end. I had 12 pages of material I wanted to discuss, and we were going to get through it, all of it. 12 rounds, 15 rounds, I'd go all night if I had to. And then you're probably wondering about my assessments of the inclusion of scholarly sources and articles, engagement in the scholarly conversation, my citation and quotation of specific pages, and the briefing documents, and of course my quibbling with the footnotes. What can I say? It's what I do. That's what happens when you put a grad student on one of these things. <laughs> we read everything, examine the methods, leave no stone, un stone unturned. And, well, as one of my professors in grad school once told me, shout out to Anita Sherman, the heart and soul of academic life is swimming in the footnotes. So there I was swimming around in the footnotes um, because that's, again, what I do. Footnotes mean a great deal to me. Um, so I found this one footnote and I became fixated on it, and I doggedly pursued it, and just read all the relevant sources around it, dealing with the NSAA, and then I started using my own resources to see what was going on, and well, you know the rest. Okay, so here we are again, back to the day of the meeting. I would have to make a judgment, put it into words, and my dissertation, I won't go into all the details, but I examine the importance of prudence, which is to say balance in all things, and reason in matters of moral decision making. I was hot, I was emotional that day, but I told myself that I would steadfastly adhere to prudence and maintain a cool rationality. I would have to weigh each of my words carefully knowing that these words did not just belong to me. That they would be picked apart and scrutinized. I would speak neither more nor less than I had to, being economical in my words, but make sure, making sure I said everything that had to be said. And so I did. With your good counsel, I did. And so it came to pass that our needs and our happiness harmoniously align. In the past weeks, I have been touched by all the love, support, and affirmation I have received from across the community. Others with DMD, parents, brothers and sisters, grandparents, uncles and aunts, cousins, PCAs, physical therapists, clinicians and nurses, researchers and scientists, advocates, and so many more across the country, across the world. In going into the ADCOM, I thought if I was remembered for anything that day, I wanted to be remembered for doing my job and doing it well. And you saw it. You saw me and you told me. And here I sit today, humble in all of you. You tell me I have acted well as your voice, and I could not hope for anything more. In some sense, I see myself as newly born, newly born as I was struck by a new perspective, a revelation. And peering through the pages of my quote book, I found this gem from Isaac Newton on humanity, on science for humanity. If I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. My friends that have passed, lived, and lived well, and for a reason, Anthony Day, Jeffrey Lee, Drew Bonner, Ben Kumbo, Michael Counterman, Matt Petrusco, Tim Wagner, Sue Helzeveri, Jason Abramowitz, Philip Carroll, Alex Lowe, and so many others. You will be forever remembered. We think of you often. We miss you. We say your names 
and remember you fondly. You are immortal. For you have brought us here to our promised land. Giants, all of you, you expanded our scope of vision. You urged us to hope for more. You have brought us to the mountaintop. As you look down upon us, we continue to fight in the struggle you gave your lives to. But today, we honor you. We take pause to live, love, and celebrate. Robert Frost said, the essential truth of life can be captured in three words. It goes on. But long before I read that quote, I learned it from my dear friend, Philip Carroll. If I'm going to go, I'm going to go like Philip Carroll, partying. Because <laughs> life's a banquet. And so, my dearly beloved Duchenne community, I leave you today with none other than the words of Fat Boy Slim. <laughs> We've come a long, long way together through the bad times and the good. I have to celebrate you, baby. I have to praise you like I should. <laughs> Thank you. No, wait. You have to wait. He has to wait. Turn around. All right. You're not getting away yet. Oh, come back. Please, I can't get this out. So today we wanted to say thank you for doing a job and doing it well and for blessing all of us. So this is our Change of Champion Award. We've been doing this for years to special people and only very special people, and you're one of them. And I am grateful for all you do and for all of those you remember. You are my hero. Thank you. Take a breath. <laughs> Dr. Shell told me that we can all use the cough assist to decrease our anxiety. So there are 5,000 cough assists back there. And so we can all go out there and take a deep breath. And then, and now I have to introduce Dr. Tim Kripe. Tim is a board member of PPMD. He's a hematologist oncologist from Nationwide Children's Hospital. And I'm happy to say he has been with us for a very long time as his wife and partner, Linda Kripe, has been with us in cardiology for a very long time. So I'm gonna turn this over to you, Tim. Well, that's an extremely hard act to follow. I have to say, in the years that I served and chaired the FDA Advisory Committee, Cell Tissue and Gene Therapy, I never saw anyone so impactful and insightful as Buddy was on this last one. So uh, thank you for all you've done for this community. It's, it's been terrific. So we, it's, even though it's a hard act to follow, we have a Cracker Jack lineup for you today to talk about gene therapy. And without further ado, I'd like to bring up our first speaker, Dr. Barry Byrne, who's director of the Gene Therapy Center at uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, and I'll ask the speakers to, after they're done talking, remain on the stage in the comfy chairs for a Q&A session afterwards. So, Dr. Byrne. Thanks very much, Tim. So, uh, yeah, as Tim said, buddy, thank you. And uh, thank you all for, for being on this journey together. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about... Uh, immunological challenges in DMD gene therapy and gene therapy as um, in general. And when I think of challenges, I also think of opportunities and ways to solve those problems. So um, I think uh, we, we do have the ability to solve some of these problems. So even though I, I'm going to show you some 
data of a variety of programs and some of the new things we've developed to address uh, these issues specifically in Duchenne. Uh, many of you have visited Gainesville as part of imaging neuromuscular disease or uh, if you're in our region. <clears throat> so this is uh, our campus and the Gene Therapy Center is located both in the Brain Institute and the first, uh, the top floor of the building in the center and where you see the curved floor, that's, that's where our laboratories are. And I always want to thank the people that work there uh, that do the studies that we do, both the clinical team uh, and our basic science and gene therapy uh, colleagues. <clears throat> so I want to emphasize a few points about the um, importance of immune management in the gene therapy area. And we've been working on these problems for a variety of conditions, but I'll, I, I really do feel that in Duchenne, it's probably one of the most compelling problems we face, and we feel the urgency uh, that you all feel in gaining access to impactful therapies um, like microdystrophin gene therapy. And m more importantly than the um, really understanding the biology, I think I want to emphasize that what we've learned in the past few years uh, really impacts on safety. And if we don't have a safe product, it's really hard to use and uh, I think ask patients to accept undue risk that um, can be mitigated through the strategies I'm going to describe to you. And, um, and improving safety can have impacts on efficacy. And I'll tell you a little about what we've observed both uh, in MDX model and in a patient study uh, regarding efficacy. And of course, as we know, in any genetically defined disease, there's uh, often advantages in early treatment. Um, early treatment in a peripheral muscle disease will almost certainly require access to repeat therapy to top off the uh, amazing effects that occur even with a one-time treatment. We think that getting greater homogeneity in muscle tissue, certainly also in the heart, is going to have a benefit. And then a question that um, has, uh, has been, uh, I'm sure, on all your minds is how to qualify and gain access to therapies. We know that we are exposed naturally to pathogens and some that are related to the vector used to deliver gene therapy, which um, I sh we should point out is not only relevant to microdystrophin therapies, but also to uh, gene editing. Uh, and base editing many of the new technologies that are, are coming both to Duchenne and other, other genetic diseases. And, and how we uh, have thought about environmentally acquired pre-immunity and what to do about it. So I start with this cartoon. You know, we have two forms of adaptive immunity in the body, B cells and T cells. The most important ones rel related to this antibody issue are the B cells. So here, Mr. B cell uh, can make a certain amount of antibodies to protect us from infections. And uh, those are usually related to exposures that we've had. When, uh, when an antibody finds a specific protein, in this case might be AAV, um, that specific recognition protects from AAV reinfection. And if we see AAV again, we start to make even more antibodies. So um, that is what I'm going to talk about, is how do we integrate all of these aspects of pre-immunity um, uh, and the immunity that follows exposure to AAV. And one of the things that uh, we protects us from viral infections is the innate responses that are constantly circulating and surveilling the, the blood for pathogens. So these innate responses happen in hours to days after exposure. Uh, and then the adaptive responses are those that follow, that are clued in by the innate responses and protect uh, both to further eliminate the infection and protect against future infections. And those um, are influenced by all different types of T cells and B cells that actually some of which protect us from having immune reactions against our own self proteins. So those regulatory T cells are something that we can also harness to improve the long-term acceptance of uh, gene therapy products. <clears throat> and so we really relied a lot on the clinical experience so far from human subject studies because um, non-clinical studies haven't really informed us about every aspect. And I'd say in some ways, primate studies have misled us about the innate responses that seem to be different 
in um, primates than they are in humans. And you know, that stems from the fact that, that there are many endemic viruses in, in the primate world, and they've learned how to get along with them. And in our more uh, hygienic environment that, that uh, humans live in, that's less common, and so we actually have a higher early adaptive response um, to viral infections. And so we saw uh, the consequences of this in several studies that were unanticipated from the non-clinical studies, and the one that was really um, quite uh, dramatic and unfortunate is the studies in myotubular myopathy, um, also an X-linked disease uh, with early muscle weakness. Um, in which there were some cases of anti-transgene immunity leading to myocarditis. We now know this is a potential problem in Duchenne as well. And um, also liver toxicity that unfortunately resulted in fatalities in four uh, participants in those studies. With the commercial launch of, uh, of the Avexis, now Novartis product for SMA, we learned that there can be um, innate responses that lead to thrombotic microangiopathy, a complication we've seen um, a very, with very profound effects in Duchenne. Um, these are less severe in SMA, but uh, now observed, as, as well as other unique forms of immune activation that uh, mimic a macrophage activation syndrome. Um, so we learned uh, through the labeling of, Zolge of Zolgensma how to monitor some aspects of this, but I will show you some data from studies we've done in uh, almost 25 SMA patients where uh, we've done very detailed immunological profiling alongside of some of our study participants in, um, in DMD studies. Um, in the solid bio study, we also noted thrombocytopenia and TMA. Uh, this uh, term, TMA, thrombotic microangiopathy, can affect all of the lining of the blood vessels, and uh, therefore the heart and lungs can have that same degree of inflammation that causes, in some cases, uh, serious events. And we saw that in the Pfizer study in which one participant, even despite a new immune management regimen, um, suffered from TMA and heart failure. Um, we uh, heard of the same consequences in a single subject study sponsored by Cure Rare Disease with cardiopulmonary failure. <clears throat> but several sponsors have adopted strategies uh, to address this, and we first uh, began this work more than five years ago for the programs we were doing in Pompeii disease where most of the severe onset of severe patients who have early onset disease are identified by newborn screening. And with knowing that we uh, would face the need for reducing in that population um, is really, really the first experience we had in humans where we actually have dosed AV twice to understand the ability to protect against the anti-AV responses and the, uh, and the ability to boost the uh, level of transient expression. And the, the first uh, systemic administration in which we block these responses was in Canavan's disease, and we've just um, published this paper in molecular therapy. Um, and now four years of uh, follow-up in that individual has um, remained non-responsive to AV and, and would be potentially eligible for the commercial product uh, that is being developed. Um, our collaboration with the NIH, where one of the systemic Pompeii disease studies was being conducted, led to uh, SIO, the sponsor of another study in GM1 gangliosidosis, to adopt this immune management regimen that we've been working on. And some of that data is aggregated in the, in the, in the slides I'll show you in a moment. Um, APIC Bio uh, also, even with a CNS-only administration for ALS, found it necessary to, um, to lessen the immune response because of neuroinflammation. And uh, Rocket Pharma is the first program that uh, was able to pivot to this approach when most of the subjects, adult uh, subjects in their first two cohorts, experienced adverse events because of TMA. Uh, this is a program for Dana's disease, uh, another X-linked disease that uh, has uh, significant effects on heart function and some peripheral muscle weakness. And now in their pivotal phase two study, all patients will be pre-treated to prevent antibody responses and the, T the TMA. 
Um, in the Duchenne program with Solid Bio, we tried a different attack point, specifically focusing on complement. Um, this did not have as dramatic effect as the very proximal effect on antibody uh, formation. And even in a targeted capsid, this has often been the notion, well, if we could only reduce the dose of the vector, maybe it would be safer. Um, 4-DMT uh, is studying Fabry disease, and in their gene therapy product, 4-D310 was specifically engineered to preferentially target the heart. Uh, they used a tenfold lower dose and still have these problems related to TMA and have now adopted the approach I'm going to talk about. Um, so here's the compartments we can think about in time. You know, what, what is present before gene transfer? What happens in the hours and days after? Um, the biggest uh, concern we've had is really about the effects of complement activation, um, and, and so I'll describe that in, specifically in a moment. And then after gene transfer for days or months later, um, what are the consequences? And we've been doing a long-term study uh, now in antibody responses to gene therapy with about five years of follow-up data. And in fact, we have one participant who was the very first subject in the limb girdle study. It's now 20 years after uh, he received gene transfer. And um, we found th that length of persistence of these antibodies. So the anti-AV immunity is quite um, p powerful and long-lasting. Um, so I wanted to, to get into some of the, the details of why we wanted to study this in finer, finer detail than is often done in the usual clinical trial, because some of the events happen in hours um, after exposure to the vector, and that's rarely one of the time points that was considered in many studies. Um, this uh, can happen both in the blood, so in the fluid phase, the immune reactions are easily detectable through blood sampling, but it can also happen within the tissue or on the cell surface, and those are harder to analyze because they require a biopsy of those tissues. And then some cases, their um, events are happening within the cell, particularly after the AV enters the cell and delivers its, its DNA, both in immune cells and in other cells in the body. And ultimately, this will affect durability of the gene therapy products. And then if there's a second exposure or prolonged exposure, as in the case of AV, because it can circulate uh, in the blood for weeks and even months, there is subsequent immunity or so-called second wave immunity which um, can facilitate the clearance of the pathogen, or in, the, in this case, the therapeutic agent of AAV. And we found that uh, the antibodies actually are the principal means by which the vector is cleared from the body and the circulation. And that wh while that is um, one mechanism to lower the viral burden in the blood, it also is an opportunity for prolonging the exposure and increasing the effectiveness. And I'll show you a little bit of data about that. And it's a, it is a complex system because it's evolved over centuries to help protect us from um, um, pathogens uh, like viruses. But uh, it has another function, which is something we can't engineer out of a particle. Uh, the complement system actually serves to detect uh, uh, parasites as one of its uh, pur purposes is to elimin eliminate parasitic infections. And it does that by detecting their surface area. And the surface area of an AV dose used in Duchenne is actually about equal to one lung uh, that is an enormous amount of surface that uh, we can't hide, hide that from our innate uh, sensors. So um, you see that some of these are dependent on the person, and we really want to know more about how individual background and the genotype of, it, of the participant or, or patient in the case of commercial therapy um, might uh, have unique uh, predisposition, and that would help us uh, guide the therapy and individualize the therapy for an individual who may be at, at greater risk. And then some of the factors that are important are dependent on the complexity of this vector, a, a biological agent that has both DNA and a protein component, um, both of which uh, contribute to the immune response and, um, and we need to learn more about the purity of these products and how to improve on them. 
I will say one thing in terms of the uh, opportunities to address this because we know that now that um, both in the, um, the label of uh, Levitus and in other clinical trials, there are exclusions based on genotype, uh, particularly in Duchenne uh, and, and other diseases where there may be null mutations. And there are, uh, are strategies to address this that have been employed in the hemophilia world uh, where there uh, are null mutations in patients lead to uh, anti-factor antibodies or so-called inhibitors. And uh, the, in, in, in the hemophilia literature, it's been well established that we can generate a long-term transgene-specific tolerance through expressing proteins in the liver. And I do think this is maybe an opportunity also in Duchenne to address some of the findings where either acute or delayed responses against the transgene are going to limit effectiveness or might impact safety. So this is an important area, but is, again, solvable. So one of the things we focused on uh, is how to measure the um, innate and adaptive responses very early after delivery. And we usually do that in the blood. In the peripheral blood, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, this would require a sampling in the muscle for uh, if there were a finding that needs to be addressed um, by looking uh, under the microscope at those tissues. So we characterize now uh, 38 patients by uh, in the first hours and daily for the first two weeks after gene transfer to develop an immune profile. And um, what we learn is you see in the block squares all those uh, participants who had uh, no other than prednisone that received as immune suppression, had early and significant responses in both the early responding IgM and the chronic responder IgG. That um, is what we measure in terms of pre-immunity. And with, within even four days, the antibody level far exceeds what it was at baseline. So this has a significant impact on the, on the success of, of gene therapy particularly the IgM molecule is the most potent activator of complement. And that in those that we block the antibody responses, half of these 38 individuals across these different disease indications um, had no IgG and IgM response, and we wanted to see how did that impact the safety. <clears throat> uh, part of the Zolgensma label, and would be the label for Elevitus, is to, um, it for, uh, um, is to understand the effects on platelets because they are kind of an indicator of what's happening in, uh, in, the, in the circulation. And we see uh, that it, when we're, there are no um, antibodies, there is a, only a trivial change in the platelet count. But the real important um, consequence of this downstream activation of complement is this component called SC5B-9. And that's the terminal membrane attack complex that injures cells. And this is, uh, contributes to the injury both in muscle and in the heart. And we saw that uh, the elevation in SC5B9 is prevented when there are no antibodies. Other complement proteins are also not consumed when, um, when we prevent antibody formation. And these are some of the assays that we do acutely to help understand whether a patient's having an adverse reaction and really try to look around the corner to those problems. And this helped us develop a timeline that, um, as you can see, the very light dashed line, number one, is the dosing of capsid. And you can see that the capsid proteins persist for weeks. And when antibodies are blocked, this is in, in the non-immune suppressed population, that can extend uh, to months, in fact. Um, this adds to the efficacy, as I'll show you in a second. Um, without antibodies in an MDX mouse, you can see that the same dose of AAV expressing a microdystrophin uh, almost tripled the amount of expression. So this is a consideration. Is there a way to improve the durability in the circulation and lower the dose and, in fact, increase the effect and also enhance safety? So there are other strategies we've considered besides just this anti-CD20 approach. Um, we've studied uh, Darzelex, which is another monoclonal antibody that has an impact on plasma cells. A uh, proteasome inhibitor called Velcade is used in transplant. I spent 
Um, the first part of my career is a heart failure specialist doing transplants, so some of this immunology is part of our toolkit in transplant, and bortezomib uh, can be very effective in uh, humoral immunity and humoral rejection, but it, it's a difficult drug to use, so we'd like to find something that's easier. And uh, thanks to really an, an outstanding example of cooperation and, and a generous support from PPMD and uh, Kira Duchenne and MDA, we're going to study another product that's recently been authorized for use in myasthenia gravis um, called Fgartinimab. And uh, so the VivGuard study should start imminently, and that was announced recently um, by, P by PPMD. So we really appreciate their efforts to support that. Um, the notion that plasmapheresis can uh, resolve the antibodies, which is used clinically in some cases of hyperimmune globulin diseases, like in B cell diseases. Um, we tested in the context of Duchenne in one patient that had an excessive antibody response after gene transfer, and you can see that it's possible to lower antibodies, but when the plasma cells are present, the antibodies are still being produced, uh, and within days, they actually return. And the transduction event did not happen within hours or days. It happens within weeks or months. So we think there'll be limited utility to plasmapheresis alone. It may be important in combination with other approaches. And this is how VivGuard works. And I'll sort of, um, maybe we'll talk more about this in the panel, but um, the endothelial cells have receptors that are called the fetal receptor for recycling of antibodies. Um, those actually help keep antibodies in the circulation to prolong their half-life. And when, um, in this case for Fgartinimab, when antibodies against uh, the acetylcholine receptor uh, cause muscle weakness, it was thought that a way to, to lower those antibodies was to block this fetal receptor for recycling. Those red antibodies also get bound to the receptor and retained in the blood. But if you bring along a agent like Fgartinimab, it can occupy that receptor. So this is part of an antibody. So it's a natural human protein that doesn't bind on the arms to its specific antigen, but it does bind into the receptor. This is the so-called FC part of the antibody. And when you occupy some of those seats in the receptor, then the um, unfavorable antibodies are eliminated. And it's not specific for those, I should emphasize, but it would lower the overall IgG po uh, content in the blood significantly even after two doses. So we've designed a study uh, that's based on some non-clinical work that showed that even two doses of Fgartinimab dropped antibody levels between 50 and 80%. And when you combine that with other strategies, and you can see in one of the combinations where anti-CD20 antibody with serolimus and Velcade actually had 100% reduction in antibodies. Without these combinations, um, Fgartinimab alone is unlikely to have a dramatic effect on those who have already been exposed to AV. But we think for those that are really very close to uh, the threshold, and, and, and luckily, um, Levitus has uh, been tested in a way that allows a higher threshold to be considered for access uh, to, to the product, and uh, although there will be a, a proportion of patients who may be ineligible because of that, and hopefully this study with VivGuard uh, in boys with Duchenne will help enlighten us about whether uh, it can be used in the context of commercial therapy. So that's really a, a very uh, quick survey of, of many years of work uh, that's supported both by an NIH grant to, to Dr. Corti, our center uh, at UF, as well as the Duchenne UK Foundation, Kindness Over Muscular Dystrophy Fund, and as I said, the outstanding cooperation of PPMD, MDA, and Cure Duchenne. Um, and that really does uh, take everyone to work together to get something uh, like this to come forward. And I hope it will have great utility as we move towards the access to commercial care. I wanted to close by saying we're really 
happy to announce that this month that we um, have uh, been able to get UF Health to understand the importance of advanced therapeutics like gene therapy. And so now the many of you who have participated in Imaging DMD have been to this building in Gainesville. On the left um, is where most of those study visits are conducted. And we've uh, completely redesigned and repurposed the floor on the other side of the building to accommodate uh, specifically gene therapy patients with 10 suites for providing access to patients that need to come uh, from anywhere in the southeast region to, to UF. And this will allow us to um, have a very uh, unlimited throughput, essentially, for all the gene therapy products, because uh, there are now two products uh, for hemophilia as well as Solgensma, and thankfully, uh, approval of Levitas. So um, I'll end there, and we'll keep, keep on going uh, through the rest of the panel. Thanks very much. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Barry. Uh, you've reminded us there's still a long way to go, and all your seminal work is really gives us hope for uh, mitigating the immune response. So next up is Chet Villa, pediatric cardiologist at the Comprehensive Duchenne Center in Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, to talk about gene therapy in the heart, another big unknown in the area. Chet. Um, so thanks, um, Tim, for the introduction. I, I think um, what is really important from what you all heard um, is you are going to learn a whole new scientific vocabulary. Um, every year when you guys come, you hear something new, but it's generally on the same topic. Um, the new therapies are bringing a whole new set of educational needs, um, and there's going to be a whole lot of learning. Typically in science, when that sort of thing happens, it takes 10 or 15 years to get to the bedside, to be deployed, and to move forward. What we are trying to do with support from PPMD um, and more broadly is to roll that out through a process that usually takes much longer in a much more limited way. So much of what I'm gonna talk about is gonna kind of pivot or, or kind of expand on how we're gonna try and do that application for much of what you heard from Dr. Byrne in real time. And I think that's really important because while you, some of you have heard me talk about one of my other hats other than neuromuscular cardiology, which is ventricular assist device therapy, the other part of what I do is heart transplantation. And what I want you guys to take away from many of these things, as at your centers, there are people who do this every day, who apply those therapies, the stuff that you heard from Dr. Byrne, things like plasmapheresis, anti-B cell therapy, all those things we apply every single day in the heart transplant population. You have people that know how to do it. We have to be able to share that information so that we can disseminate that to you guys as families, but also to other centers so we can learn quickly and develop protocols and harmonization documents that will allow us to do that as safely and as effectively as possible. So here you see my disclosures. And this first word of caution is actually not in the typical way that most people would think about caution. What I want you to know is this is not a talk on why not to get gene therapy. This is how are we going to move forward with a therapy that we all believe has a significant amount of promise, but also a lot of unknowns. As you heard from Dr. Byrne, they're putting this together as they go along. That's gonna take some time. If we wait for that to happen, we will have missed a critical window, especially based on the current approvals for who may receive therapy. So we're gonna try and do it a little bit faster, but that will come with risks, but it also allows us an opportunity to deploy some of the machinery that's been funded recently. And so really when we're talking about, um, about what we're gonna try and do from a cardiac perspective, it's really gonna focus on a couple of things. One, planning. That's getting the team in place if these things happen so that you're not trying to do this right um, in the moment. If, for those of you who were here last year, I, I used a, a, an example of how I go grocery shopping versus how my mom goes grocery shopping. When I go grocery shopping, I never bring a list. I wander, I go through the vegetables, then I forget, oh wait, I needed basil, and then I'm in the middle of the bread aisle, and then I was like, oh bread, I need crackers. 
and you're trying to put it together as you go. That's not an effective way to do this. When she goes, she has a list, it's in a way, she gets through, she's done, and over. And especially for what you heard, which is some of that immune response to the vector can happen within hours, you do not wanna be creating that pathway, the therapeutic pathway, and have the team in place on the fly. You want to have that in advance. We also need to know what your son's heart looks like to begin with, so that we know if we see changes, what is new, what is different, and it also allows us to track and understand what these different injuries, if they do occur, mean over the long term. That gets us to that second part, which is data. Um, one of the things from an action perspective that we talk about is stealing shamelessly and sharing seamlessly. For a lot of these things, as acute events happen, we know the events happen, it spreads through social media, but then there's actually kind of limited follow-up, I think, for many families, for some clinicians, depending on how they're in there, so, so it, it spreads by, by hearsay. We want to be able to share data um, across um, centers, but also with families, so that we can learn much more quickly. Even a very large center, um, based on what we know of the current safety profile for these therapies, it's going to take a while to, to see a lot of these events. That is a very good thing. But if we use the single center model, it'll take us five to seven years to learn how to deal with this and how to effectively deal with it. If we come together as a group and be able to, to share those experiences, pool data, and learn on the fly, adapt our, our therapies, we can do this more effectively and develop kind of clinical care models that will be used and modified in real time. Um, when we have generally talked, and what you have heard in a lot of these um, the lectures to date is, is about myocarditis. Um, but when I think about myocarditis from a, from a cardiac perspective, it is part of a larger circle of potential cardiac injury. And why that matters is Duchenne is a little bit different because the typical um, models for how we defined myocarditis, especially in the current era, um, are really based on MRI. Why that's a problem for Duchenne is over the last couple of years, a couple of, of different centers, ours, Jonathan Soslow at Vanderbilt, Conhor at Nationwide, and others, have shown that many of the markers we use to describe myocarditis in a non-Duchenne population happen at baseline. The, the cardiomyocyte injury, the damage, the swelling that happens, the scar that happens, all of those things you've heard us talk about as part of a natural history of Duchenne actually are how people define myocarditis. So we're gonna have to be able to integrate that with a new paradigm and understand relatively quickly. Um, so, as many of you have heard, what we, what we typically recommend is echo and MRI. I just told you why MRI may be important, but it's not going to be um, a be-all and end-all because it's going to be probably a little bit confusing to us in the beginning. It will form an important part for those people that have significant injury and in the longitudinal follow-up. So what happens when you're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and you've received these therapies? Can we compare what your heart looks like to other people who have received it? And the answer is we're going to set up the infrastructure to be able to do that. The other part with any of these things, whether it's cardiac injury from a heart attack or from myocarditis or from COVID-19 or the COVID-19 vaccine, all of those sorts of things, um, can set off abnormal rhythms, which are important to understand and to treat. Um, and, and one of the things that we will talk about is, especially for these, there can be acute cardiac injury that can sometimes be severe. We have care paradigms and ways to treat through that to allow those immune system um, therapies to kick in. And that is going to be a very important point at any of your centers. We have ways to support the heart to allow the immune system therapies to kick in over the period of days and weeks. Um, and then the other part that you've heard, and it's been mentioned through some of this, um, is, is troponin leak. Um, and, and why this is important is a couple of years ago, those of us who were trying to use this for typical safety um, for drug therapies realized that there was troponin leak at baseline. So troponin, think about it like the cardiac version of CPK. Most of you know that. That may have been how your, your, your son, daughter, or you were diagnosed. 
Troponin is the cardiac version of that. And there are a couple of different kinds, um, but we have started to realize that that happens at baseline. And so why that's important is that's one of the ways that we usually risk stratify cardiac injury, myocarditis and cardiac injury. So understanding what your son or your um, baseline data is is gonna be very important because that may be there at baseline and we don't want you to think that there's new or ongoing cardiac injury that may already exist. Um, and, and in fact, we had a, a, an article about this because it was starting to become a relevant issue for actually for drug therapies um, a couple of years ago. There is now significantly more data on what this looks like and why this may be important. And, and then to go towards kind of that dissemination, how we're trying to do that. Uh, if you heard me talk yesterday, one of the things Action does is develop these harmonization documents so that we can try and learn together. Um, right now, it's gonna focus on diagnostic. What we think is the best diagnostic approach for baseline to understand where your heart is right now, but also so that we can understand how that process evolves. What you heard from Dr. Byrne is there are a couple of different um, uh, periods of, of injury mediated by the immune system, that early response, one that's a little bit later. But then there's also another point that's important for anybody who's taken care of hearts um, in Duchenne realizes that the heart is already at risk anyways. You can get a pneumonia, you can have a fall, you can have um, uh, FES, you can have any of these things. And those periods of stress and strain with a heart that's already at risk can also have damage. And we need to be able to track that, understand that, because the long-term implications of that may be different. If your heart gets affected by the initial response to the adenovirus, that may carry a different prognosis than the new dystrophin that's produced if you develop an immune system to that or the stress and strain that comes along with any of the rest of the stuff. And so really, that's why I said it's really important for us to be able to understand what's happening up front, develop therapies that can help to mitigate that, share that quickly, understand what happens over the midterm, over a couple of months as the immune system starts to modify, and then finally, what is happening over the long term in response to each of those, because I'm gonna bet it is not going to be exactly the same. There may be different risks long term depending on what the type of injury is and what the severity of the injury is. And if we don't pay attention from the beginning, we're going to be asking five years later, well, what would have happened if this and what about this and what about that? We're trying to learn in real time right now. Um, and then I, I mentioned some of the medications that, that Dr. Byrne had, had, had talked about, which is these are antibody-based therapies that we use every single day in heart transplantation and for what we call antibody-mediated rejection. Before I left in Cincinnati, we were using many of those same things on a patient that we are taking care of. You have people at your center that can deploy these therapies. Setting up a system and engaging the right people in advance will help it go quicker if you do have one of these responses, but also allow us to do it better. The other part is ventricular assist device therapy. Um, most of you have heard me talk about it in the setting of chronic heart failure. There also is another application of ventricular assist devices, different devices than what we are typically talking about, but for people who have acute injury. So this myocarditis is actually the textbook example. Somebody comes in, they had no known heart injury before, they have an injury because of a virus, a new drug or other things, and the heart is severely impacted, it is stunned. We can actually support the heart in that circumstance to allow other therapies and we sometimes can allow that heart to come back. This needs to be planned in advance. We need to understand what you want as a family, what you want as a person, depending on your age, about how we're gonna move forward so that we can allow these things to happen. Again, you do not wanna be deciding this with something that is evolving over the period of minutes to hours. You wanna have a plan in place, the teams on board, because we do have therapies that can allow us to treat even the sickest of patients and improve those outcomes um, as much as possible. Oftentimes, there, there's not, we don't always get the outcome we want, but you wanna have this in advance so that you can rapidly deploy your team. The other thing is, is if you're in a center or live in a place where you can't get that, you need to have, here's what we're gonna do. This develops, we go here, we do this. You're not gonna be wanting to go through a call pool tree trying to figure out who to talk to um, if some of these things happen. 
Um, I think that's really about it. Um, thank you, everyone. I think thanks to everybody with action. Um, a, a specific shout out needs to go to Linda and Deep. Deep um, is actually leading the effort and trying to put this together. Um, Jonathan Saslo, who talked, is, is providing some imaging recommendations. Beth Kaufman at Stanford has also been integral in helping us learn. Um, and then uh, Arvind, from a, from a neurology perspective, um, has been really helpful. So. Thank you, Chad. Okay, next up we're entering a, a rapid fire industry uh, se section, six minutes each. And first up to, uh, is Nicoletta Stoysha from Solid Biosciences, medical director there. Uh, please come up to the stage and share us uh, the work from your company. And thank you, Chad, for reminding us that this is complex and everyone's different and uh, we need to be very careful about all of these kinds of issues. So, Nicoletta. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for uh, having us uh, here. Thank you, PPMD. Um, I would like to um, um, start with our uh, forward-looking statement. We are a public uh, company uh, pending uh, IND approval. And um, also, uh, for those uh, who do not know, um, uh, solid biosciences. Uh, I would like to introduce our uh, new program, uh, Dushan HGT003. And also, I would like to mention that uh, we are a genetic uh, medicine company who uh, develop treatment as well for uh, neuromuscular diseases and uh, for cardiac diseases. Our uh, headquarters is in uh, Charlestown, Massachusetts. We were uh, initially founded in uh, 2013 by uh, those directly impacted by uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy with an initial uh, focus on uh, DMD and looking to make a treatment for it. And uh, just last year, uh, by uh, acquisition of uh, Avanti Bio, now we are focusing uh, not only on uh, uh, rare neuromuscular diseases, but also uh, on uh, cardiac diseases. Sorry. <laughs> now, uh, as you can uh, uh, see, sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> the technology. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now as, uh, as I mentioned, we have a um, um, new combined uh, pipeline, uh, neuromuscular uh, uh, Duchenne and uh, cardiac uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with HGT003 uh, as a lead uh, candidate. Now, uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to give you a little bit uh, of history of what uh, has been done in the past. Uh, we'll present our uh, SGT001 uh, and our uh, new study, and our study which was uh, called uh, Ignite DMD. Uh, Ignite DMD uh, was a phase one, two clinical trial looking at uh, SGT001, which is an uh, AV9 uh, based microdystrophin uh, gene therapy. Now, um, as I mentioned, AV9 is one of the first uh, generation natural uh, occurring uh, capsid. We'll see a little bit later that uh, we took a lot of learning from uh, the initial study. And now with the new capsid uh, that we've developed in the lab, have formed a program called SGT003. In the first uh, study that we did, uh, we were able to look at uh, uh, multiple uh, patients that were dosed uh, across uh, a wide um, age range from uh, 4 to 14 years old. We focus on uh, evaluating uh, safety and uh, microdystrophin expression as primary endpoints, and also look at uh, changes in uh, function and uh, patient reported outcomes as uh, secondary endpoints um, uh, using assessment uh, such as uh, North Star ambulatory assessment assessment, uh, six minutes walk distance, uh, pulmonary function test, quality of life uh, measure as a pediatric outcome, and all these assessments are going to be used also in uh, SGT003.
Now, I would add also to, uh, to mention that uh, consistent with the, our uh, programs um, and um, other programs in uh, Duchenne gene therapy space, the most uh, important uh, adverse events were uh, nausea and vomiting uh, immediately post-infusion. Uh, in the study, were also uh, observed uh, serious adverse events uh, re um, uh, related to the systemic inflammatory response. These events were uh, resolved uh, within 90 days post-infusion, and the no treatment associated adverse events uh, were uh, reported uh, after 90 days post infusion. Results also uh, showed uh, positive trends from baseline to one year data for motor function, pulmonary function test, uh, and uh, patient reported outcome measures. Development uh, of uh, AGT001 uh, has concluded with the next generation SGT003 program using an update construct with the novel muscle tropic uh, capsid uh, currently in uh, IND enabling studies. Additional update uh, on uh, Ignite DMD are expected to be provided following uh, completion of uh, five years uh, follow-up time point for all, uh, all the participants. Now, uh, as I mentioned, our uh, next generation is uh, SGT003, um, our new generation uh, candidate. Um, with um, microdystrophy in gene therapy that we are moving forward uh, using a novel uh, recombinant viral vector. The HGT003 construct uh, is made up of our proprietary microdystrophin uh, construct that uniquely include the, the NOS binding domain, uh, potentially helping uh, to prevent activity induced ischemia and uh, associated muscle, uh, muscle injury uh, based on uh, no clinical studies, uh, together with the novel capsid uh, AVSLB101 uh, that we developed to improve muscle targeting. With this, you can see in the middle panel the difference between SLB101 and uh, AAV9 uh, capsid in uh, MDX mouse model and uh, wild type, the intense red signaling uh, corresponding to a higher, uh, higher microdystrophin expression uh, for the same dose level um, uh, with the new SLB101 uh, capsid. We also uh, changed the manufacturing process to transcyan transfection, uh, which has shown additional improvement in microdystrophin expression compared to SGT001. Uh, now, uh, with that, uh, we were able uh, to just one moment. With that, we were able to look not only at the mouse study, but uh, uh, to take a step forward and to look at uh, large uh, species like uh, non-human primates. And uh, with monkeys, we see a multiple fold improvement in uh, biodistribution uh, versus the natural occurring AV9 consistent with the mouse data. We have optimized uh, the capsid to bring the best possible therapy into clinic. The capsid has shown improved uh, skeletal and uh, cardiac muscle tropies. Skeletal and cardiac muscle tropism with uh, uh, reduced uh, uh, liver expression. Now, uh, today we are uh, working uh, hard to, uh, to actually to put together our uh, IND for this program and uh, finalizing uh, the last uh, pieces for uh, submission to uh, FDA uh, with the positive results in uh, toxicology and efficacy study, similar with the earlier studies that uh, we've run that demonstrate a high level of microdystrophin expression. Pending IND clearance uh, from the agency, we will provide more information to the community uh, related to clinical trial, including eligibility criteria, clinical trial sites in the United States, and timing. We also look forward uh, to hosting a webinar with the PPMD later this year and to provide uh, more information uh, regarding this uh, new SGT003 study. Now, uh, at the end, I would like uh, to thank you, the um, uh, PPMD uh, community and uh, all patients, families who do choose to participate in clinical trials and to reassure that we are looking forward uh, to sharing more details related to the study with the community later this year. Thank you for your attention.
Great, thank you for that. Next up is Olivier Danos from Regenex Bio. Uh, Dr. Danos is a long-standing leader in the field of gene therapy, and we very much look forward to hearing what you all are doing. Chief Scientific Officer. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to tell you about Regenex Bio's uh, program in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, gene therapy for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Those are my forward-looking statements. Uh, Regenex Bio is a leader in AAV gene therapy. We have end-to-end uh, -end capabilities from research to commercial stage manufacturing, a broad pipeline that does include muscular, muscular disease, and we're based uh, and headquartered in uh, uh, Rockville, Maryland. Uh, I'll tell you today about this program, which is a microdystrophy gene therapy uh, program. And basically, this, is, uh, this slide is explaining you our approach to microdystrophy. What we've done, which may be different from uh, uh, the, our, our, our peers in the field, was to fully redi redesign microdystrophy and uh, importantly, include uh, an extra uh, functional domain at the C terminal, which is indicated in red here on, this, uh, on, the, on, the, on the slide. And this, uh, this domain had been excluded from the microdystrophin so far because it's known to be not essential for bringing up the dystrophin to the sarcolemma and forming the, the, the dystrophin-associated protein complex. Uh, and, 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 and those dystrophins are indeed functional as shown in, in, in animal models. Uh, but uh, it is also known that if you, if you can add the C-terminal, you eventually bring back additional functions that eventually uh, add functionality to this microdystrophy. This is something that's been, that's been uh, described in the literature uh, in, in, in the MDX uh, uh, mouse model. And this is also something that we've uh, demonstrated again uh, in, in, in our hands with our, with our construct. So we're, go we're coming with a, with a new construct that we believe may have added properties. Uh, and this is our approach, uh, we're using AAV, in our case AAV8. Uh, we have, um, uh, the, 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 the dystrophin is controlled by a, a muscle and heart specific promoter. It's a synthetic promoter called SPC512. Uh, and there are an, a, a number of other uh, optimization in the construct, including the exclusion of CPG dinucleotide that, that, that are something, it's one thing that eventually enhances the innate immunity against the vector. So with, with that, we've done all the different steps from research to preclinical studies, and we are now in a clinical phase. Uh, we, 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 we have two active sites, one in uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and another one in Chicago, and I'm very happy to announce today that we've started dosing patients uh, recently. So we have patients that, that have received our, 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 and it's still very early, um, I'm just going to get you more details on the structure of this, tr this trial. Eligibility criteria, we're targeting patients from four to 11 year old, um, basically with mutations that exclude everything uh, before exon 18 for reasons of uh, uh, eventually immunity against uh, the, the new microdystrophy. Uh, those patients are ambulatory and they, are, they, they, they must have no antibodies against uh, AAV caps, AAV8 capsid in this early phase of the, of the, of the trial. Um, we're, we're assessing safety, uh, essentially, and, and, and foremost. We're uh, measuring strength uh, on, this, on these patients after, after treatment and function by the North Star, using the North Star assessment uh, scale. Uh, and, and eventually, we're, we're looking at microdystrophy uh, in biopsies that are taken three months after dosing. Uh, also, there are, there are a number of functional evaluation along the way of skeletal muscle and heart uh, function, uh, function. This is another representation of it. Uh, this also shows that uh, before dosing, we do uh, apply immunosuppression, a pretty comprehensive re re regimen of immunosuppression that does include uh, Solaris, eculizumab, an antibody that uh, prevents a, a, a complement response. Um, and this is prophylactically applied. That is, that is uh, that we, we, we do that before dosing. 
Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, uh, serial immerse is used and, and a, a, a regimen of corticosteroid. So these regimen are transient. They're they are over after, uh, after uh, three months. Uh, and after that, we measure mu muscle strength again, uh, and, and we use imaging as a, as a, as, as a tool for uh, measuring the, 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 the status of the muscle in these patients. Um, this is just uh, our, first, our, our first trial. With, uh, we start with just a few patients in cohort ones uh, at a dose of uh, 10 to the, the 14 GC per kg. Eventually, uh, after IDMC review, we will uh, uh, up the dose and, and eventually extend the, the, the first cohort at the, at the low dose as well. Um, so that, that's the, the actual clinical trial going on. We have another study in the clinic that I just want to mention quickly, which is a study of the AAV, anti-AAV antibody that are present in the Duchenne population. So, uh, very quickly, uh, this study is about, uh, I mean, is currently enrolling, and we plan to enroll about uh, 200 U.S. patients, uh, boys between 0 and 11 year old, uh, diagnosed with DMD, and uh, obviously who haven't re received gene therapy yet. Um, so in summary, uh, we, our, our RGX202 uh, product is uh, uh, in clinical trial now, and patients have been dosed. Um, and uh, uh, basically, uh, it, it, this is, I mean, the, 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 this, this work wouldn't have been possible without the interaction with the, the patient community here, and I hope we'll, 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 this is only the, the beginning of the, the, the story for us here. Um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, don't, don't forget to, to be in touch with us. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is Shi Chen, Chen from Pfizer to tell us about the uh, Pfizer clinical trial. And while she's walking up, I'll just comment, 20 years ago when I first came to this meeting, there was no research, and it's so gratifying to see all these clinical trials now. Uh, Shi. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much for uh, allowing uh, myself to introduce to this community for the first time. Uh, my name is Qi Shen, and you can call me Qi. It's the same pronunciation as the Chinese word for energy. So I'm very privileged to be standing here today as the first time attendee to this remarkable conference. In the last two days, I have witnessed the immersing passion, knowledge, and dedication from all of you. So I'm really humbled to get connected with all of you and contribute in this collective effort to fight for Duchenne. I would like to take a moment to um, express my deep appreciation to this organization for creating this dynamic platform for patients, families, researchers, and clinicians. Today, as the representative for Pfizer, I would like to share um, our advancement of clinical program in the DMD gene therapy. Uh, today's presentation contains some forward-locking statement. As today is the third day of the conference already, and all of you have heard a lot about AAV, based gene therapy, so I'm not gonna repeat the comments for this technology, just point out some specifics for our Pfizer AAV9 gene replacement therapy here. Um, we use the recombinant AAV9 uh, capsid, which can have a high transduction efficiency in skeletal muscle as well as cardiac muscle cells. We used the uh, truncated version of the dystrophin gene. As you know, the gene is too big to fit into the AAV capsid. So we have to use a truncated version, however, still maintain the sufficient function. Um, this mini dystrophin gene is modified from the dystrophin gene from a Becker patient. We used a muscle-specific promoter to drive this protein expression in the skeletal and the cardiac muscle cells. So this gene replacement therapy is anticipated to be a disease-modifying agent. 
to slow down the DMD disease progression and enhance the motor and the respiratory functions. In 2018, I think we started the first in-human study using our um, DMD gene therapy here. Uh, this slide shows the active studies currently in our uh, program. I will go through the three interventional studies, the phase one, two, three studies in the next couple slides. But here I want to highlight two non-interventional studies we recently activated. This year, we activated a long-term follow-up study, which will enroll all the patients who treated in our interventional trial from phase one, two, three studies for additional 10 years long-term follow-up for safety and efficacy. We already started uh, to have patients enrolled into this long-term follow-up study from our phase one trial. Another study we are conducting in the United States is to recruit patients, family members, who have been, you know, the patients have been dosed in our phase two and three trials in the United States side. Their family members have the opportunity to join this non-interventional study. It will help us to learn the serial conversion rate for those people who have a close contact with patients undergoing our gene therapy. And our phase three study for non-ambulatory patients is still under planning. So here, let me go through the interventional studies with you uh, one by one. The first study is our phase 1b study, which is the uh, initial trial to evaluate the safety and the tolerability of our gene therapy. The study recruited 19 ambulatory boys aged from 4 to 12 years old. We recruited, uh, we dosed the first three patients with uh, low dose gene therapy vectors. After clearance of the safety, the next 16 ambulatory boys were dosed with the high dose vectors. Um, the high dosage is the one we are currently exploring further uh, in the program. In the phase one study, we also recruited three non-ambulatory boys in the trial for safety evaluation as well. The study have already completed the recruitment and dosing. All the patients are in long-term follow-up. Um, so the uh, one year and the two year efficacy readout have been published and presented in scientific conferences. Um, in 2021 as well, uh, in 2022 as well as this year. Um, CIFRO trial is our phase three pivotal study, which is a double-blinded placebo-controlled um, global study. This study is to recruit approximately 99 participants. About 66 of these patients will be randomized into um, the active treatment arm um, at the first year. So these patients will receive our gene therapy at year one. Another 33 patients will be randomized into the placebo arm um, for first year. And in the second year, the treatment will be crossed. So the 33 patients received placebo treatment will be able to receive gene therapy in the second year. All patients will be followed up for five years after their uh, receiving of gene therapy. The primary endpoint for this study is the total score of North Star ambulatory assessment change from baseline at week 52. This study only recruits ambulatory boys aged from um, four to seven years old. To expand the um, knowledge on this gene therapy into a younger patient's population, we initiated a phase two study called Daylight Trial last year. This study is to recruit 10 ambulatory boys aged two to three years old um, to get this gene therapy. 
the primary endpoint for this phase two study is also safety and the tolerability of this gene therapy in this younger patient population. Both the daylight and the CIFRO trials have completed the recruitment. Um, and currently, we are undergoing a protocol amendment to standardize the um, follow-up procedures for safety events. So we are expecting all the patients will be able to uh, complete dosing in the next several months after their uh, protocol amendment has been approved in their countries. Um, here, I want to take this opportunity to emphasize um, Pfizer always put patients as our main focus in our clinical trial development. We work with all of you, and the patient's representatives are included in our steering committee and external data monitoring committee. Um, your voice are heard, so we have adapted your recommendations and the concerns in our trial design and execution. So come talk to us if you need to. Um, and I would like to thank all the DMD patients and the families to work as our partners um, to find a cure for Duchenne and appreciate all the researchers, clinicians, as well as the patient advocacy groups for your engagement and the support to moving along um, our clinical development. Uh, and the last but not least, thanks for PPMD to bring us together. Thank you. And our final presenter today is Doug Ingram from Sarepta, uh, who, as we all know, was the first to get FDA approval. Congratulations. So eager to hear about that. And then we'll open it up for questions after he's finished. Good morning, everybody. It is an honor to have an opportunity to talk with you this morning. Um, as you all know, last week, something I think monumental happened in Duchenne. The FDA approved, as you know, the first gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a levitus. I will also say very directly that we had sought a broader label, and we have initially a, a narrower label, but it is still an extraordinarily monu monumental moment, and it is a moment for hope, and I hope I can impress that upon you, because we are going to move to a broader label as fast as possible. This is an enormous moment for those patients who have access to this therapy now, and it is a significant milestone in our near-term goal of broadening the label to offer this therapy to the vast majority of Duchenne, Duchenne patients, both in the United States and around the world. Let me start with a thank you. This approval last week would not have occurred without the work of hundreds at least hundreds of people. It started some 20 years ago in the labs of Nationwide Children's Hospital where Jerry Mendel and Dr. Luis Rodino Claypack worked tireless to optimize what is now a levitus. It then included hundreds of dedicated professionals at Sarepta, our outside advisors, clinicians, investigators, their teams. But I really want to give a special thank you to the Duchenne community itself you were an enormous part of getting to where we got last, uh, last week. It was your prodding, your encouragement, your criticism when we deserved it, your insisting that we move rapidly that got us to that approval last week. And I want to thank the brave families who participated in our clinical trials that it supported the approval last week. You took a risk not merely for your own child, but also on behalf of all of the Duchenne patients that will benefit from Elevitus. And if you wonder whether the voice of Duchenne and the community matter, look no further than Buddy. For those of you who may not have seen the advisory committee that occurred in May, I can tell you definitively that Buddy was more eloquent, he was more prepared and more informed and frankly, more courageous than any other member. And in my humble opinion, Buddy is responsible for changing the arc of the universe for Duchenne. He deserves an enormous gratitude from Sarepta, certainly, but from the entire community, and frankly, I think, from the scientific field. It was 
in my view, brilliant. And of course, we saw it again today. I'm going to talk. Yeah. I'll talk briefly today about three things. I'm going to talk about our commitment to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm going to talk about our ongoing clinical trials and development program for Elevitus. And then we'll talk about how we're going to get this therapy with our success to the broadest possible patient group, both in the US and around the world. We are committed to Duchenne, and we have been committed for a very long time. We have four approved therapies now, as you may know. We have three oligonucleotides, and of course, as of last week, we have a gene therapy, a Levitus. But don't imagine that we're done. We are absolutely not done. The vast majority of our creative energy and our resources goes to trying to fight this disease and bringing a better, longer, richer life to uh, boys and men and children with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have, beyond just in, uh, bringing a levitus to the patient community and broadening that, um, the a levitus, we're going to uh, continue to focus. We have advanced RNA, we have additional gene therapy, we have gene editing, all focused on Duchenne. And I'm going to talk a lot. We, we mentioned U.S. a lot because this was a U.S. Appro approval, but I don't want you to imagine that Sarepta is my myopically focused on the U.S. There are hundreds of thousands of Duchenne patients around the world that need therapies like Elevitus, and we are very focused on this. In 2019, I am proud to say, we entered into a partnership with a first-in-class organization, Roche, who will bring this therapy around the world, and I am confident we couldn't have chosen a better partner. Roche has the resources, the skill, the expertise, um, and the commitment to serve the community around the world, and that's gonna be a big part of what we do in the future. Time does not permit me to go into detail on all of the clinical data that supported the approval of Elevitus. Let me just say very briefly that it was supported by over 140 patients. It was supported by multiple studies. It was supported by tracking patients out to over four years, and we still have studies ongoing. We have our confirmatory trial. That trial is called Embark. That study will read out before the end of this year, and that will play a pivotal role in broadening the label and the opportunity of Elevitus to treat patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we have just started what we call our non-ambulatory and late ambulatory study, and that's called Envision, and I'm gonna talk about that. So let's talk about Envision. First, there are three major goals of Envision, ultimately. One is it supports the approval of this therapy and the broad label of this therapy around the world. The second is we are going to take a cut of this data for safety before the end of this year so that when we approach the agency to broaden this label, we have sufficient safety data to justify removing any kind of restriction regarding ambulation. And thirdly, we'll get long-term data from Envision that will be very informative and valuable to the community and to our efforts. Envision has two cohorts. It has, it has 148 or so uh, patients, obviously we've just started dosing, 120 of those are in a cohort that's not ambulatory. We've listened to you, there is no age restriction on that issue. And then the second cohort are what we call late ambulatory, but it's actually from 8 years old to 18 years old. Envision is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with a 72-week endpoint. For those who may believe that in this population, a placebo-controlled trial is inappropriate, I want you to know I agree with you. I entirely agree with you, and it would have been more appropriate, one would envision, to use an external control. But to be direct with you, I have to live in the world we live in, not the world we wish we lived in. Regulators around the world and in the U.S. demand that we have a placebo-controlled trial, and so to get this therapy to the broadest possible, possible patient population, this is a placebo-controlled trial. The good news, however, is that every patient in this trial will get this therapy. Some will get it initially, and then in the other half of it, will get it at 72 weeks when we have um, a crossover. And then we will follow patients out for another five years. For those who are interested, the primary functional endpoint for Envision is something called pull, which is performance of upper limb. So let's talk a bit about how we're going to move um, a levitus from the label we have to broadly uh, available to patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But let's do it by talking about the restrictions in the current label. So there are three ways in which this label can be uh, limited. 
Obviously, the first way is the, the um, age restriction. It's currently restricted to boys that are four and five years old. The second, of course, is that um, patients that are testing positive for neutralizing antibodies to RH74 are excluded. And then the third way is that there are, there are certain risks of innate immune responses to some early exons that we had committed ourselves to reducing as exclusion. So let me take this in reverse order on what we're doing and where we are. Let's start with those early exclusions. As you may know, at the time that we started this confirmatory trial in BARC, which was some time ago, we were aware that there was a theoretical risk of an innate immune response in some of the early exons. And out of an abundance of caution, we actually had an exclusion that covered all exons from 1 through 17. We also committed ourselves to doing the work in the science to reduce those exclusions if possible. And I'm very proud to say that the, the team did that. The studies did, re, did result in good answers on that regard. And in our approval last week, that's been far ex reduced, the exclusions. So right now, the exclusions from the label are those patients that have a mutation that, are, that cover exon 8 and or exon 9. Currently, those uh, children are excluded from, for safety reasons from being dosed. Now, let me give you an example because I just heard a, a recent example so we understand one another. If, for instance, you have a deletion of uh, 5, exon 5, but you don't have implication of exon 8 or 9, then you can be dosed under the current label and you can be dosed um, safely. Now, those, that 8 and 9, that results in about 5% of the Duchenne community that do doesn't have access to Elevitus. And while 5% isn't very high, it's enormous for those patients that, are, that have an exclusion or a deletion in exon 8 and 9. We're not done yet. I want to be very clear. We need to continue to explore how to reduce that further, but we have to follow the science and we have to make sure safety's first. So as it stands right now, we can't dose patients in the 8 and 9 region. That's for very legitimate safety reasons. Let's now talk about the neutralizing antibodies, and we've heard Barry talked about some of those issues as well. So the good news, I suppose, is that um, we have a fairly low screen out rate. It's about 13.9% 13 of patients with Duchenne will test positive um, above the, the, the excluded um, titer for uh, binding antibodies for RH74. But again, if you test positive, the fact that you're in the minority is cold comfort. So we're working on that, and we're working fast on that. We have two alternative studies this year, one to cleave neutralizing antibodies, one to clear neutralizing antibodies, and we will have an answer to those studies and data from those studies next year in the hope that we'll be able to solve this issue and safely dose um, children that were otherwise um, environmentally exposed to something that looked like R874 and would otherwise um, not be in the label. And I must say, we are very confident that we'll get there. If we don't get there, someone else will. We're going to figure this issue out. And then the final thing, and of course the largest exclusion in the, tr in the label right now, is the fact that we're limited to four to five-year-olds, but we have a very distinct plan to move rapidly to remove those um, age restrictions. Um, so Embark is our pathway to, to doing that. Embark is our placebo-controlled confirmatory trial. That trial will have last patient, last visit in September. We'll have a readout from that trial before the end of this year. We will provide that information to the, the division even before we have a filing. We're going to provide it to them as soon as we have it quality controlled from a top line perspective. And we have a commitment from the FDA right now that they are going to prioritize the review of that data. And if Embark is, is, is successful, and of course I have an enormous amount of conviction in its success, that they're going to remove the age restrictions for um, Elevitus, which means that if we're successful, ultimately, we can be in a place where we could offer this therapy to as many as 95% of children with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so let me end where I started, with an enormous thank you to the Duchenne community. You, you need to understand, and I, I, I worry sometimes that people think that as we move along, that there's a point at which the patient voice is less valuable. Nothing could be further from the truth. Again, I will repeat myself. You saw it in spades last week, or in May, with Buddy. You, we get nowhere without the voice of the patient community, without your encouragement. You're holding us responsible for moving quickly. Your commitment to these therapies and fighting for your children. 
We got where we got because of that. We will broaden this label because of your support as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Please, you get the most comfortable seat there. So uh, now it's time for question and answers. I believe we've gotten approval to go a little bit into the break. How far? 11.15, okay. So we're gonna have a, a good 20 minutes or 25 minutes. So please come to the microphone and uh, ask your questions of the panel. And while you're lining up, I think I'll ask the first one. So the FDA uh, had a lot of concerns about manufacturing, empty capsids, et cetera. Uh, can you, t and, and I think it's hard for the audience to distinguish the different microdystrophin programs. Um, can you tell us briefly what your process is for production and, and your empty capsid status and what you think may distinguish your product from the other companies? Are you talking to me? Uh, I'm talking about all four of the industry folks. So. Uh, we I'll can start, start with you, Doug. But I'm going to sure. limit my answer just to ours. I'm not going to speak competitively, obviously. We, we use um, an adherent process um, called Icellist for our therapy. I know there was a uh, discussion of that at the advisory committee. I want to be very clear. Um, that was an issue that was long resolved. The issue of empty to full, so let's understand it. The issue in the manufacturing process you, inevitably, you have to have a significant percentage of empties with your folds. So there are two theoretical issues with that. The first issue is efficacy, right? Because if you're delivering to a patient an empty capsid, meaning it doesn't have a gene cassette in it, then that capsid doesn't actually participate in expression and you don't benefit from that. But the good news is that's easily solved. So we, and I'm sure our compatriots at, these, at other organizations, essentially do the same thing. You dose to the fulls. You don't dose the total amount. So when we say we're, you know, two times e to the 14th or 1.33 times e to the 14th as our dose, we're talking about the fulls, not the entire amount. So from an efficacy perspective, that's solved. The next question is safety. If you're, if you're burdening a patient with a, an excessive amount of empty capsids, do you have a greater risk of some immune response or some other untoward response? That's an empirical question. You'll know that empirically. And the empirical answer is we're, no, we solved this issue before we ever entered our confirmatory trial, which was a year and a half ago, in conversations with the agency that concurred in that, with us in the approach, which is if you're, if you're seeing empirically a good safety perspective, and I think our approval last week ought to um, confirm that, then the, the empty to full ratio is, is very good. Now, it will be wonderful if we could get down the road and have an even better full to empty. That could be really valuable. Prob probably, though, the most valuable thing about that is that you could have a lower cost of goods and therefore find a way to bring this therapy to patients at an even lower burden on payers and then increase access. She, any comments about your manufacturing process or other things that might distinguish your program? Yeah. Um... I would say, like we have, like in Pfizer, we have a, um, a quite a state of art manufacturing center for the gene therapy, and we're working with the agencies to really, um, you know, uh, ensure the delivery of the um, the gene therapy and the quality of that. Um, and Doug said, you know, we are measuring the gene therapy dose by the actual transgene not the total amount of the vectors, you know, which include sometimes with certain volume of the empty vectors. Uh, the patients are dosed in our study with the actual dosage we are measuring, and uh, the safety has been consistent throughout different batches of the production. Olivia? Uh, yes. So uh, without repeating what's just been said, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the, you, can, you can improve the process up to you know, close to 100% of full capsids, and, and some patients at the beginning had been dosed with such processes, but they're not, just not viable. They, they're not scalable. They cannot be, the, the costs are, are, are incredibly high. So we've been developing processes where we get a, a proportion of, of, of empty capsids which are very reasonable. You know, the, the, there was this uh, kind of unwritten or un, 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 unofficial uh, 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 limit set by the FDA, or not set by the FDA, set within discussion with the FDA at 50% empty or 50% full. Uh, I think everybody's level now is much higher than that, right? And as I think Doug said, this is a constant improvement. So, so 
Regenex Bio has a process which is a, a, a 2,000 liter bioreactor process uh, 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 followed by purification that, that removes some of these uh, empty capsids and some of the, also you, you have all kinds of things, not only anti, anti capsids, it's about uh, partial genomes being encapsidated and, and that can also have an impact on the safety of your product. So the, it, it's actually more complicated than just empty capsids. So, but we have a process which has been vetted by the, by the FDA, which is now, the, which we now use in the, in, in the, in the clinic, and, uh, and uh, I think we're, we're on tracks. And Nicoletta? Yes, uh, we uh, improved uh, our manufacturing process uh, as well uh, using uh, transient transfection, and uh, our um, uh, research data showed actually an uh, improved microdystrophin expression. We're going to uh, share more information uh, about uh, this uh, uh, when we're going to have our uh, webinar with uh, PPMD later this year. Barry, I think you had a comment. Um, yeah, I was just going to comment that this has been a continuous learning process. Uh, AV vectors were first isolated and developed at the University of Florida 30 years ago. Um, we pioneered many of the current manufacturing technologies, expanded on new ideas, and now we committed to actually completely redesign the process to really uh, direct, directly address yield and ultimately cost. As Doug points out, this will impact access related to other places besides the U.S. So um, we think that this is solvable as it was uh, in monoclonal antibodies and, um, and in the future I think this will help improve critical product, product quality attributes and, and make it more accessible. Question from the audience. Thank you. Sarah Kasner, I have two little boys, um, eight and nine, Caleb and Dunkey, that unfortunately fall in that 5% um, with a deletion of 6 through 17. So my question is for Pfizer in your phase three, have you already, can you share if you've started dosing patients and what the parameters or exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria are? Thanks for the question. I think in our um, Pfizer study protocol for this age group, we have exclusion criteria with these axon mutations. And the study have already completed recruitment, so we're not, plan, and there's no plan like in the current study to explore these mutations, you know, currently excluded. Yes. Let's go to this side of the audience. Uh, this question is for Sarepta. Do you expect the gene therapy will ultimately replace your exon skipping ther therapy? Well, they're, they're, they're going to compete with each other and, and you know, I can, I can um, editorialize what I think. I think that um, our oligonucleotides are, are, have been enormously, enormously valuable. And we have next generation versions of them as well. They could be enormously valuable. Um, I think the Levitus is profound. The amount of expression that we're making with the Levitus is order of magnitude more than the oligonucleotides typically make. And so I think there is a possibility that the gene therapy ultimately will replace some of the oligonucleotides. Now there's another thesis that says perhaps the best answer for a patient is to have a combination of both a, a levitus and an oligonucleotide. But we have to do the work on that to justify making statements like that, and we don't have that yet. Okay. Thank you. Back to the side. This is for all of the companies, and I'm wondering when we can anticipate seeing some cardiac readout. Could you repeat that louder? When will we see cardiac readout? Whether or not the DEEM therapy helps or hurts the heart? We're, well, so I'll start with us. Go ahead. That's going you know, to take some time, given the patient population that we've studied. We have to track them for a long time to begin to see those sorts of issues. The good news from an expression perspective is, you know, we don't do obviously cardiac biopsies in children that would be enormously risky and, and burdensome, but we've done a lot of preclinical work that tells us that we get very good expression in cardiac muscle and dystrophin, and of course, as we all know, dystrophin is crucial for cardiac performance. In fact, our promoter would suggest, at least in the preclinical models, that we get a, you know, as much as 20% more expression than we get in skeletal and diaphragm muscle. 
Yeah, uh, I would concur with that. You know, this, this is carried on in our long-term follow-up period for all the studies. So we will see and measure the cardiac functions in the long run. I mean, certainly there's, there's non-invasive cardiac measures, so there's not a biopsy needed. And the question is, will there be any interim analysis, or it will wait until the end of the five-year period for all of you, or, or beyond? I'll have to explore that with, with the, the R&D team. It's a very good question. Thank you. Let's let the other. Olivia, do you have comments about cardiac monitoring in your studies? Well, for our study, we're, we're, we're including uh, measurements of the, uh, of the cardiac function, but this is short term, and, and you know, as has been discussed today, uh, it's likely that we're going to have to take longer time to, uh, to, 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 get, to get an answer. Uh, but in terms of you know, the toxicity, the obvious thing that, that could happen, we're going, we're going to look at it for sure. Chad, do you want to make yeah, some comments? So to give a couple of points, so if you're going to be dosing four to five, or for the people who have already received doses earlier, the answer is actually we can get it. So to go to some of Doug's points, we actually do have natural history data. We have two large data sets, at least, that can show us the development of LGE, so fibro fatty changes, and the change in systolic function. We now have thousands of MRIs to be able to show that data, so the natural history comparator is there. Based on that data, we know that 10 to 15% of boys as all comers will have ed evidence of LGE before then. So my answer is, I think that natural history comparator is there, and I think it, it is incumbent on the group here to actually produce that data, because we do have natural history comparators for you. That data exists now. Nicoletta, any comments about cardiac monitoring in your studies? Uh, for uh, FGT001 study, we have um, uh, data already reported, uh, one-year data, and uh, so far uh, we didn't uh, um, see any uh, cardiac toxicity. And uh, I'm talking uh, also uh, about a clinical trial and um, a step forward in a, a kind of like preclinical studies with the new uh, FGT003. Again, we didn't uh, see any cardiac uh, toxicity. Uh, I'm talking also for uh, uh, non human primates, uh, for uh, monkeys. And um, any other information for uh, uh, longitudinal uh, five year uh, follow up data? Uh, we are going to be able to, um, uh, to share with the PPD community at the end of the uh, five-year uh, follow-up time point for all the participants. Let's go back to this side of the room. Yes, I was just wondering if uh, maybe one of you could speak to uh, sibling protocol. For example, I have one son who is age-wise eligible to receive a gene therapy, but I have an older son who would be ineligible. Uh, what can we do to make sure the other son doesn't get exposed to the uh, viral vector and whatnot? Mm. Who wants to take that? I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, we do have sibling protocols like in our pivotal trials um, that we allow siblings to participate together. However, they are not considered as randomized group. So to avoid, you know, one sibling gets the active gene therapy and the other get placebo. And another thing we're exploring, as I mentioned in, in my <coughs> presentation, there's a serial conversion study, and we're trying to learn, you know, if there is serial conversion with the family members have this, uh, you know, intensive interaction during the infusion time, you know, right after the infusion. Uh, we're trying to learn that because the AAV, you know, vector is not supposed to, to be replicative. Uh, during the high vector shedding period, is there any risk for other people around the patient to have the sterile conversion? Um, and this is something we are exploring and learning. Anyone else have comments about? Um, and to your point, this, sterile conversion is a, is a concern. It, right now it seems to be a theoretical one. I, I'm not anecdotally at least aware yet of um, seroconversion that's occurred even among, you know, clinical investigators, for instance, that work with um, patients, that, and there are many patients that have been dosed. So, it, so it's still an issue that we need to resolve, and that's cold comfort to those who worry about their um, children. I know between um, getting a negative RH74 um, test and dosing, I know, you know, families are particularly concerned as nothing happens, but 
I'm, it, it may ultimately, after additional work, be less of a concern than we, we currently think it is, theoretically. This side of the room. Yes, uh, my question is for Sarepta. Um, you had mentioned that um, there will be some looking at these earlier um, exons that are affected. So I have a son who um, has a nonsense mutation in exon 11. So my question is, um, can you just explain, I've been told a little bit, but just explain the challenge um, specific to that you know, to those early exons in terms of the gene therapy, and then when do you anticipate um, looking at those? Well, first, if your son, you know, not to provide advice, if your son has a, um, a nonsense mutation in exon 11, that isn't covered by the exclusions. So the exclusions that we have in the label right now, and it's based on um, the work we've done, we did a, a separate study on this issue to frame it out is any mutation that has a deletion in eight and or nine. Um, and that's where we are right now. And the, and the reason we have that exclusion is because there is a genuine concern, a real risk. This is not theoretical, a real risk of a potential innate immune response around those areas. Um, we need to do more work to see if we can, we can better characterize that and find a way to, to narrow those exclusions. But, you know, that requires science um, and it has to be a science driven issue we, we, we don't have the ability to do it without doing a, a bunch of additional work so we're exploring that even now but we have a lot of work to do before we can get to a place where we are confident that we can exclude it you know uh, further than we currently have if that makes sense okay so you said for the nonsense they would still be a candidate yeah ex exxon 11 alone is not um, affected by this exclusion in the label. Did you or any of the other companies have uh, patients in your studies with a nonsense mutation that early in the gene that is then ver therefore missing much of the downstream part of the gene and therefore might be at a higher risk for uh, having an immune reaction to the full length? So far not to None. our knowledge. No. Okay. Let's go back to this side of the room. Hi, my question's for Sarepta regarding the gene therapy. I didn't realize that you, until I was sitting here in this presentation, that you had a non-ambulatory arm, and I looked up your exclusion criteria. What I'm curious about is my son is non-ambulatory. He's on Beyondis 53. His ejection fraction's below 35. Would that be an exclusion from the trial? I, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance, and I, I will, I will, we'll, I'll get to you after the, the meeting, and we'll get the answer to you right now, but I don't have the detail on that to be able to answer it without fear of being wrong, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Back to this side. Hi. So this is for Sarepta. Um, my son has a nonsense mutation on Exxon 10, and he's higher on antibodies. So uh, we live in Spain, so I'd like to, if it's possible for you to comment a bit further on a time frame for your next trials, including antibodies, and if you have something in Europe uh, and in the US as well. So uh, if you can comment on that, please. So just to make sure I understand your question, you're specifically about, your, your son has tested positive for pre-existing neutralizing antibodies to R874? Correct. And that's the question. So, here, and again, I want to be very clear. We have, to, we have to follow the science and we have to have the data to justify it. We do have a lot of conviction that this is an issue that will be solved. I think, Barry, you would agree with me. We'll, we're going to find a way as, a, as, a, as a, an ecosystem to solve this issue. We're trying. We have two different approaches right now. One is apheresis, where we clear the antibodies. We're going to try that. There's a separate trial where we have a partner um, named Hansa that has a therapy called imlifidase that cleaves um, neutralizing antibodies. We're going to do a separate trial on that with the hope or the goal that maybe one of those two will allow patients to be below what's, what's called 1 in 400, which is the titer uh, below which you, you can be dosed. And we'll, we'll actually start both of those trials this year, and we'll have data from both of those trials next year. And then once we have the data in hand and we have confidence about whether that can be done, will move as fast as possible to empower dosing in patients that are antibody positive. Will you have sites in Europe as well? Yes. Would, you will? Yes. All right. And do you see any 
um, exclusion criteria regarding his mutation. It's a nonsense on exon 10. No. No. Not to the best of my knowledge. All right. Thank you very much. We have a little under five minutes left. Let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Lisa. I have a son uh, with a nonsense mutation on exon 24. So my question is for Regenex Bio. Uh, I did enroll my son for the antibody test, and he, uh, in his blood work, they did not uh, detect the antibody for the AV8. So we're trying to, uh, we're in line in Arkansas for the um, gene therapy. So my question will be, um, if he received the gene therapy for AV8, does it mean he's going to have antibody for other AV class, like uh, AV9 or RH47? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I understand everything. So, so can, can, you, can you repeat the, the question for me? Cross-reactivity with the antibodies against different serotypes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, th there is certainly an overlap. Uh, uh, but the, the extent of this overlap is something that we don't, I mean, we haven't measured with, with any precision, so it's difficult to, to predict. Uh, it's also, um, so even if, even if there is an overlap, uh, it's about what's the level where we have the, the cut in the, in the, in the trial for, for inclusion, right? And that, that's, uh, for instance, in the first patient that we do so far, we want to have zero antibody measure. That, that's, that's just because we want to get started with the, the most favorable conditions. Uh, and, th and then we'll, 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 get up, we'll, we'll get it up, right? Uh, so, that, yes, the, 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 there is an overlap, uh, but then, then it's going to be a case-by-case -case consideration, right? So does that mean uh, even after the uh, gene therapy with AV8, uh, if my son was successful uh, enrolled in the clinical trial, that if in the future there's going to be uh, gene therapy with AV9, we can still try to uh, test for the antibody, see if we might be eligible? Uh, I think so. If I ended, yeah. I didn't get that. Uh, I, I, I think the question was, would, would there be eligibility for a different AV type even yes. after a participation in an AV8 study? I, I can address it because we've now uh, both in qualifying patients for studies where we screened about 200 individuals. We've also tested another biorepository of over 400 samples of, of boys with Duchenne. And there's broad cross-reactivity across all of the current AV serotypes. And even those that are so-called evolved next generation capsids are based on the existing ones and where they share, in some cases, only a few amino acids difference. Um, which is quite remarkable that that dramatically changes the tropism of the AV, but it doesn't change its immunogenicity. So one would have to apply the same strategy you would use to get the same capsid again as you would to any other one. Um, so generally, this is an important consideration when entering a study. Exposure to recombinant AV for therapeutic purposes raises the antibody level a million times over the baseline. And so that would be far above the exclusion level of any other experimental therapy or commercial therapy. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is my friend. She's coming from Germany. Uh, she's going to ask question for Pfizer. I will just be here in case she cannot explain herself very well. Thank you. Okay, I think this will be our last question. Okay, maybe uh, I need her sometimes. Um, my, my son is the Duchenne with the duplicated 44. He's four, 14 years old, but he passed away I, and a half years ago because he instead to take um, COVID-19 COVID vaccations because he needs no more life without certification. He cannot visit restaurant in Germany. So, but after it, one week, as the first um, first, he cannot work anymore. Before, he can work at home in, uh, five, six meters. Then five months after the second one, he passed away. But actually, before it, we asked the Chinese of Germany doctor if he could take the this can, but nobody said they cannot give us very clear um, answers. So actually, um, I think about if I will talk about this, but uh, I actually, I joined the community 10 years before. We set up the Chinese um, Duxian community 11 before. Now we have still 5,000 boys, um, mainly 5,000 boys in China. Also, we have a lot of boys in 
in the world. So I think it's uh, possible for uh, to set up. Yeah. So she's uh, asking uh, if there should be like monitoring uh, for Dushan kids after uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, like her son uh, lost ability to walk uh, like only a week uh, within the second dose of the vaccination uh, and uh, he passed away within a month of the second dose of the um, COVID vaccination because uh, due to heart failure. So she's asking um, if we should um, like give the parent caution uh, to dose for the vaccination. Yeah. So actually, mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's to appreciate for the for the communities to before 11 years uh, there are still very few pharmacy company. So I think my son gave up the fighting for Dushan, but I come here after I stopped for two years. But I still see there are more uh, pharmacies to fighting continue to Dushan. So I actually I very appreciate it, but I didn't complain. I just. Um, maybe I just said it out. Now I, by lesson learned is to, I also said yesterday is very important for the heart functions. I, I think the course of my, the life of my son, um, let maybe raise the, all the patients, pay attention for the heart functions. So actually, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, for being here, and for pointing out the global need and the side effects of all these thank complicated you. therapies. Uh, Chad or anyone else have comments about monitoring post-COVID vaccination, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think it is. It, it has become clear um, that especially young men do have a risk of, of myocarditis that's out of proportion to other populations. But I think it also is important to say that I have taken care of many children with and without Duchenne and actually adults um, who have had COVID myocarditis. The challenge with understanding that risk profile is, is substantial. Um, we had patients who passed away from complications of COVID um, at different stages, some of whom have cardiomyopathy, some of whom had respiratory disease, and some of whom died of the inflammatory response to COVID. Um, I would say there is no right answer. There wasn't a right answer at the time because trying to sort out where that risk benefit was was very unclear. Um, it, is, it is clear that there is a, a myocarditis risk and I think people have modified the recommendations accordingly, but I, I would say I talk to every family um, now because it still comes up even if it's lessened, um, that there are times when science answers, here's the right answer, here's the wrong answer. When it comes to that with evolving serotypes, with evolving risks and with baseline steroids, this isn't a time when I think science can tell you the right thing or the wrong thing. It's a very individualized response um, for each family, and that is hard. We get up here and try and, as you've heard from multiple people, we let science try and guide us. There are times when it can't, and we make the best recommendations we have um, because unfortunately I've seen both sides of that for COVID. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you for that. Thank you, panelists, for sharing your science, pushing the field forward, sharing your stuff today with us. And thank you, everyone, for participating. <laughs>